Okay, this video concerns the expression narcissism of minor differences. It actually comes from the observations in human behavior that those with more uh, in common or with uh, similarities seem to be the very ones that amplify minor differences uh, even over fundamental uh, similarities. And uh, my expression for it is hyper differentiation. Now, uh, there's non 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 denominations now there's so many denominations that they even have the same names but they have to say no we're the non denomination but we're baptistic or no we're the non denomination but we're uh, more charismatic or we're so they still have to have their superordinate categories uh, we're not Methodist, we're First United Methodist and this just goes on and on and what happens is it becomes uh, somewhat of a indicator of the obvious that by that it's so obvious it's obscured that no one notices but as a pastor of a church for example when I intervene uh, for let's say a married couple or parents or families you'll find that the problem that they're experiencing is in the very context in which they were uh, that was created by God for that not to be experienced. That is, there's nothing about the Bible doctrine of marriage between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, who might be future father and mother, that would be inherently evil. That would have to be imported from outside into the culture. And for example, in a new covenant community, a new covenant church, a new covenant marriage is to nurture and foster. And for example, even if there is incompatibilism, as some describe it, Paul was speaking in relationship to an issue in a church in Corinth where adults had been converted, and yet a spouse may be with an unbelieving spouse. That could be someone who's never trusted into Jesus, or it could be someone that lacks the fidelity to the covenant of marriage. And he said the faithful one would not be bound by the unfaithful one, that is, the marriage would not become uh, commandeered by someone who would redefine it. So if you're in a relationship from which you'd have to recover, that's no relationship. If you're in a marriage, for example, or you are parents dealing with children, it's striking because I've often asked someone, I said, I asked a man once, I said, so what's your problem with women? He said, well, I don't have a problem with women. I said, okay, so you only have a problem with the woman to whom you're married? And he didn't notice the irony of that was that was supposed to be just the opposite. So when we raise people up really here in the Nurture and Adventist Lord as a pastor who teaches and we adhere and follow, we, strength through we experience strength through the structure, discipline by design. We have child training, which is what we experience here in the church, training upwardly, which is to narrow channel and keep our focus on Christ, the head of the church, as uh, to observe his teachings, to work things out first and foremost between ourselves and God and then likewise with our neighbor. For example, we come here as fathers to our children, husbands to our wives and brothers in the covenant. We would go to a brother first and foremost, reconcile that matter because the interest which our lives have been called out to serve would be that of Christ, the head of the church, and his interest is to assure that his father, God, receives the glory in this church by Christ Jesus and the beautiful description in the metaphor of the Holy of Holies speaks of this body here, this church under the headship of Christ, assuring that Jesus fulfills his interest, which is to assure his Father receives the glory by him. Uh, we're described as uh, the Holy of Holies, where the uh, Spirit of the living God is housing here in this assembly. So we're not talking in brick and mortar temple terminology. We're no longer talking in terms of brick and mortar uh, facilities uh, that we, in which we would process people. We're talking about a living, the living body of Christ, a unified body, and we're here growing in grace and knowledge. We're here all being conformed to the same image. We're all here growing to the full measure of the same person, that is the stature of Christ, so that when I, for example, officiate a wedding service, I can tell the young man, now you lay down your life for her and love her like Christ loved the church. And I can point to Landmark Missionary Baptist Church, Jacksonville, Arkansas, 2200 Marshall Road. And when I tell her during the wedding service, now you submit yourself to your husband like you see the church submit herself to Christ. And I can be meaning Landmark Missionary Baptist Church, this assembly right here in Jacksonville, Arkansas, that she was 
uh, aware of if a member growing up were to hear or if someone who has come into the fellowship, she would definitely see quite a contrast between the culture of self-destruction, uh, the mockery of even the term relationship. Uh, people call things relationships and yet they need to recover from it. So it's that's why there's a program that came out recently called Divorce Care. Well, it's really divorce recovery. You have to recover from a divorce. Uh, but again, this is about the narcissism of minor differences. How can people have so much fundamentally in common? Why do people not want to find common ground? And yet with the very thing with which they hold fundamental um, similarities, they can amplify the smallest things. Well, that's called hyper differentiation and it's, it's self-serving. But when R.C. Sproul quoted in his book, uh, his account in the book is The Mystery of the Holy Spirit, Dr. R.C. Sproul. Uh, Christian Focus publication, Kindle edition. It's very inexpensive if you would like to look at that. But I'll just quote a few things here. He said that his professor wrote on the board, Regeneration precedes faith. He said, These words were a shock to my system. He said, I had entered seminary believing that the key work of man to effect rebirth was faith. Now, first of all, he's looking back now in retrospect because the key work of man, he's, he's now showing his bias uh, and to add a negative connotation to faith, which is not a work, it's believe, it's poeo, a do word. Poeo meaning is the verb do in the Corne common text, very wordy, easy to read and understand for common people to live according to this for the one who is extraordinary, exceptional, the Christ. So if trying to figure out how to live for Christ is so complicated as men make it that they find themselves preoccupied with hyper differentiation, and with magnifying uh, small differences, then either they're doing that by introducing these differences or by supporting and continue to sustain them rather than evaluate them, define, document, and disclose them, and then just remove them as we do at Landmark Missionary Baptist Church. We purge out the old leaven, including fallible religious constructs. So he's now backloading his argument. He said, I thought we first had to believe. First of all, we don't have to believe according to the Bible. When Jesus came and taught, he uh, gave us authority to become sons of God. Religious established order, established religious orders and their leaders who commandeered the kingdom of God were withholding that authority, that right privilege extended to us so graciously by Christ so that those who believed into him, he would then give them authority that was otherwise denied. In the United States of America, for example, here at Landmark Mission of Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Arkansas, just right here in the shadow of the C-130 base at the Little Rock Air Force Base, we have the inalienable right to come here peaceably assemble, live out our faith according to the teachings of Christ, according to the 2,000 year unprecedented uh, prevalence of his churches, the definite kind of churches that he said, I will build my particular kind of church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That includes all the conspirators. And looking back, read history. So when people don't find it much of the, to serve their interests, much to live in a covenant community of the headship of Christ, to conduct according to his teachings, to assure that the interest of Christ, which is to assure his Father receives the glory, to acknowledge the church in the highest opinion that Christ gave her, that she is housing the spirit of the living God. So we have the Holy Spirit, the metaphor of the temple, holy of holies. We have the description, Christ is the head, but he actually in function as well. He presides over this congregation. We have the receipt of the glory, the opinion, which is to the Father, which is by the Son, Christ Jesus. So it's a marvelous thing in the Bible to see the harmonious arrangement. But you can go ahead and read the rest of this, but he talks about faith, then rebirth, and justification. And he said that's what he once thought. Well, while he's, while he's echoing all that, we'll just stop for a moment and look at the things that we know. And again, like I said, I'm only wearing my uh, hat. It's my, uh, it says native pride. It's got a nice feather on it. It's, it's my favorite hat, and I really like that. But, uh, and I'm in a little room in a warehouse-type metal building, so it's, I don't feel like I'm disrespecting by wearing a hat indoors, and I was trained better, but you'll have to indulge me for a moment. But when we talk about faith, are we talking about a noun, or are we talking about a verb? And when we say faith re precedes regeneration, or regeneration precedes faith. Now, this is a flannel graph, and it's very nice. I love flannel graphs. And as an educator, I find it very useful to approach situations. So, got my 
little dowel rod is my pointer. We have finite verb, we have faith, we have participle, we have regeneration. And so I was gonna put the word noun up there, but I already have a noun up here that was expressed that way. It was expressed in a noun form. It was expressed already. So regeneration precedes faith. So we notice we don't have the distinction between uh, a finite verb and that. So we'll look at a participle and it's a participle as a verbal adjective. As such, it can both act as an adjective with the qualities of a substantive. Sometimes you'll hear it called a gerundive noun, a verbal substantive. If you go and use these little books, and that's the book, a very great book, by the way, uh, How to English Grammar to Ace New Testament Greek. Really, really good, but very, very inexpensive. Uh, Samuel Lamerson, uh, published by Zondervan. Just it's the nicest little books you'll ever have there. And then um, Participles uh, in this book, very great book, called English Grammar for Language Students by Frank X. Braun, PhD, Basic Grammatical Terminology. Again, when you educate, you'll notice if you're watching one of these videos, you'll start getting sleepy. You won't be radicalized, you'll be tranquilized. You'll be like, oh my goodness. So as a pastor, it's really good to inoculate people to the radical elements, as even R.C. Sproul's testimony said, when someone moved this around and changed it, it really shook him and shocked his system. And well, now we have people that, you know, express very ugly things toward each other about regeneration precedes faith or no, it doesn't. And if you watch the video produced by wretched radio Todd Friel, I think it was in the last few years of Dr. John MacArthur, as he was exiting from his presidency of the Master's Seminary, he kind of signed off on all of it. He just said everything's true. It's true whosoever will may come. It's true God's sovereign. He just went on and on and on. And he kind of just stepped away from all that, which was very interesting, very courageous, by the way, to have advocated and insisted upon certain things so concretely that it incited, uh, it became frictive, it generated friction, and it actually aroused in others that which was probably the ugliest thing about them. So this antagonism came, well then he just kind of steps away from it, and I, uh, I think he still pastors, but that's another story. But uh, it says here, uh, participles are words that participate. So that helps, participle, participate, participate, that helps. And so it says the formation of a sentence as verbs or adjectives, so it functions adverbally or adjectively to describe uh, we have eight parts of speech. You can look this up in a, well, even in this grammar, it has that. There's um, that really eight categories is what he's referring to. And if you uh, notice the um, freedom you have, I mean, there's participle is not one of the eight parts of speech. It's a subpart, like a particle, a negative particle. It's not big enough to be a part. It's called a particle. Well, it's uh, nouns and pronouns, adjectives, verbs, adverbs, prepositions, conjunctions, and interjections. Well, when you think about it, there's just verb and adverb. There's noun and adjective. Then there's pronoun. And then there's conjunction that joins those nouns. And then there is the uh, preposition. Think about the word preposition, preposition. So now let's look at this and see what we know the Bible actually says because that's, that's what's of interest right now, is what does the Bible actually tell us so that we can understand what's causing all this trouble? I mean, what's the problem with minor differences? I mean, like I said, my favorite hat says Cherokee on it, and I, my grandmother was born on a concentration camp in Kingfisher County, Oklahoma. Kingfisher County, yeah, city of Dover, Oklahoma. Uh, the city of Dover in the county, Kingfisher County. So can we find common ground since we have a book that's called Koine Greek, written in Koine Greek? Well, in John 20, 31, it says these things were scripted, and that is the signs of Jesus and their contextualized narratives were scripted and remain scripted. That is their own record for us in order that we might believe that's a finite verb, puncture action. So right now we, we're looking at faith as an action now, finite verb. I love my flannel graph. It's not mine. I, I absconded it from the children's class next door. So if something falls or it doesn't work out, I'll do the best I can. But again, it's an unusual day for me. I'm kind of reverted back to my flannel graph and my 
the professional expert teacher educator that I am and as a pastor of one of those churches the, you have to have an aptitude it's called for to teach now that's for the sake of others not for me why would I uh, care to know all these things and share bother to share all that if I wasn't called to feed sheep I'm not here to um, make room for goats and the head butters and these people who have a narcissism for minor differences especially such a an expression of it that if they have to they'll construct a minor difference to have something about which to uh, we would say uh, generate friction and division so now we have John 20 31 the finite verb to believe and then it says and as ones who are believing now that's a participle we still need to find this here so what do we do with this here because you know, Mr. Spruill said, this happens over here. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 4.15, that we're fathered through the gospel. Fathered, notice that we're fathered. Fathered is a verb through the gospel. Paul said, 1 Corinthians 4.15, if you notice that. He said he had fathered them through the gospel. So having done something so remarkable, that is, uh, Paul in Christ Jesus, fathering through the gospel, he tells us that the gospel is the instrumental means through which we are fathered. So we go to 1 John 5, 1. 1 John 5, 1. Now, in 1 John 5, 1, we'll notice that John, the same writer of John 20, said that everyone who is believing, now that's a participle, that's a gerundive noun, he then used perfect tense. He said, for the verb, it's a finite verb. He says, so everyone who's believing, that serves as the subject, the uh, gerundive noun, the verbal substantive that we just read about in our grammar. Now, you didn't go far in school uh, without learning this because when we were younger, we were kind of coerced, even in this nation, by the state. I know my family, when I read the history of what happened to the Cherokee, and of course, I do know that as people remind me, you have to go and take a DNA test and all that stuff. I'm just talking about the family that I am connected to who were born on a concentration camp in 1906, uh, my grandmother, and then the last survivor of the Trail of Tears didn't die until 1932. And then of course, uh, just 30 years after that, I was here. So back to these minor differences in education if we're forced to integration is forced upon us and we're you know we have our hair cut properly now and we have our multi degrees and we you know now it's just a novelty to say you know identify native pride and have my you know whatever so it's just good to teach people and help them to not be entangled by what doesn't entangle us as teachers but first john 5 1 says that the regeneration precedes the participle. So we've got the participle here, and we're saying the person fathered out from God is the one generated out from God. And it's not re there. There's no word re there. It's not regenerate, it's fathered. So the one that you want to find who the father of these ones who are believing, that would be the everyone who is always believing. Now that's upsetting to people who you know, on the other hand, you have people that say, no, you won't always be believing because of being fathered out from God, but the Bible says we are. And then others say, well, you can't be believing or can't believe prior to regeneration, but the Bible says the gospel's first, the finite verb, faith here, it's a finite verb, simple form of action, and thus we believe. But now, if we set this up the way the Bible does, whose interest does that serve? I mean, when we know that the two most, uh, well, as we would say, the most popular, the two most popular, let's say, the two most popular soteriological traditions, both, let's say, Arminianism on this side and Calvinism on this side. So on Calvin, the front of, front of it, Calvinism says, you can't believe. And on the other hand, let's say on the one hand, Calvinism says you can't believe. And on the other hand, Arminianism says you won't continue to believe. And Calvinism says you won't believe unless you're first regenerated. And Arminianism says you won't continue to be believing simply because you were regenerated. But now, the new creation in Christ Jesus is so remarkable that that's 
not even a possibility. But now how does that help if we find common ground that we have the gospel, we have the um, purpose of the signs that Jesus performed, and he did that just as in Exodus 4 where Moses said, they won't believe that you sent me. And God said, well, take that rod in your hand, toss it onto the ground, and then pick it back up again. So when he tossed it on the ground, it became a serpent. He picked it back up again, it became a rod. And he said, do that in their presence. And that way they will cause themselves to believe that, you, that I sent you. Now, that's interesting because we see God using signs signs, things that we humans can see and notice. And in these signs, when we notice that, then there's an expectation on God. So when you read John 20, 31, it's in order that you should, that's deliberate and you should do it, let's say, let's, the way we would understand an obligation, but it's in order that you might, so that how, how could we? So that you could believe that Jesus is Christ. What would we have as a credential of Christ but the Gospels and now that we have the Gospels and they are historical and they have we have scripted signs so people say they believe in signs wonders and miracles I do too I have scripted signs wonders and miracles that are better than anything I otherwise would perceive or consider myself to have experienced and we can all go on and on and share uh, that but I've never noticed, noticed people uh, wanting me wanting me to conjure some kind of sign for anything on their behalf or interest. I've never understood that. Uh, praying for the sick seems to be heartfelt enough and knowing that the perfected testimony of Christ has freed us from codependency upon spiritual men at that time, those very dramatic spiritual men. So here we are. We have the answer according to the Bible, but if it doesn't serve the interest uh, that could become uh, very difficult, uh, especially in an age where we're in now, where there's so much about minor differences that I've had, you know, people tell me they didn't like my favorite hat because they don't like red and they didn't like my native pride, Cherokee and proud of it. And I'm like, well, I was only wearing it because I can. <laughs> so I was only wearing it because when I read history, I admired the Baptists who walked on the Trail of Tears, they have a trail of blood in their faith and we have a trail of tears in our family. And whether I'm connected genetically or not, somehow the circumstances found my grandmother born there in 1906. So it's quite a history there and it's another scar on the face of our great nation. But what is it about the narcissism of minor differences is because whatever self-interest is being served by the difference now, if it's a natural organic difference, such as uh, color, uh, like me, my accent from being in Arkansas, well, I really think it's funny too, because I often tell people that come here and obviously speak the English language, which I don't, but they will speak it. And I notice they're not from here, and I'll tell them, well, you speak so quickly. And I said, I speak so slowly that if you're crossing the street and a car might hit you, I can't help you, because by the time I say, watch Al, you're, you're done. The car's already hit you. And they'll laugh because I think it's funny because I was in a situation where a wedding was, uh, I was invited to officiate a wedding and, and sometimes it's with very diverse people. They traveled in from all over and I'm just walking around fellowship and enjoying the freedom to talk and introduce and be introduced. And someone said, oh, I just love that Southern accent. Well, I was not aware of it. I was incognizant of it. So whatever our minor differences are, when it comes to the scripts, there are some things about the scripts that are, are designed to assure common ground. For example, how would we as a New Covenant body function if people constantly brought in uh, fallible constructs, they brought in, uh, amplified their minor differences, especially since they're just between their ears. I don't find people who amplify minor differences in a new covenant community doing anything more than serving their interests socially. And it's called, I call it the social church. I call it hyper differentiation. Uh, it's called hypocrisy, the leaven of the Pharisees, Jesus said, so purge that out. So when people come here and feign a concern based on an assertion they're making, which is based according to a, a, a minor difference that they now amplified into a major fundamental uh, disparity. Uh, you just ask them a few questions and you find out 
more often than not, I've learned as a pastor now for decades that they don't even know the meaning of the word they're using. They may have read uh, maybe the account of R.C. Sproul and noticed where he had begun to, let's say, uh, his biases begun to script believe as a work and then uh, began to transfer uh, the notion of had to believe rather than what Jesus was teaching to people like the poor blind man who received his sight. His own parents were so intimidated by those who had absconded the kingdom of God, commandeered the kingdom of God, that they said, he's of age, let him speak. Now, we can hardly imagine what that'd be like to have a child born blind and then receive their sight so graciously by the loving, gracious Lord Christ. And then we be in a circumstance that had been so commandeered by vulgar, wicked, lewd, horrible religious leaders that now we're intimidated to even rejoice that our son was, uh, sight was recovered and that we don't even want to, well, we say today, well, I would stand up and speak up and shout out, no, not under those circumstances. They knew they'd be cast out. They would be living on the streets. She had been turned out to be a harlot. He had been consigned to be a tax collector to extort from his own people just to carve out a living and then the authority of them to live as children of God would have been uh, even more uh, not only removed but then they would have been experienced the punishments that come from religious leaders who will somehow dish out punishment which I have no idea we've had people come here thinking that I would fall for some feigned consequence should I not go along with the um, minor difference and often constructed which existed on between their own two years so as this winds down Jesus is the one who stepped in when he heard the man was cast out of the synagogue and asked him said are you yourself believing into the son of God he said how can I believe that is deliberately caused myself to believe get to believe not like R.C. Sproul said had to believe now get to believe and it's not a work it's a do and you were, were causal beings so we're designed to do it and he then told him who he was because the blind man said unless I know who this man is how can I believe in the Son of God how can I deliberately causally do this and Jesus says it's me I'm the one that's asking you so then the man calls himself to believe so you have a blessed day and go back to your plan wrap and like I said if you like my favorite hat I, I tell you some people you know they don't have a favorite hat but I've got one and it's 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 my favorite hat and it's native pride and this is my favorite uh, my one of my sons directs corne sports and he engages young people and i just i tell you what i don't want to get too excited like i said i will uh sign off with uh you know letting you know that uh here, um, here's my favorite hat native pride and it's a real nice hat but think about the narcissism of minor differences that it could be in all of us to find ourselves uh, so self-serving that we're no longer uh, loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and body, and strength, but rather uh, much less. And then we're not loving our neighbors ourselves, but rather we're placing hurdles and hoops in their presence and watching them become exasperated. And Jesus, we are ambassadors for Christ. I was a royal ambassador as a child. I studied in the Sunbeam house and uh, we're to come along and as ambassadors for Christ, push the pause button and say, come over here, you who are heavy laden and tired, and we'll point you to the one who will give you rest. And that word rest is pause, literally like a pause button. So if you're not pushing pause, that's not love. And if you're involved in relationships or you're nurturing or encouraging relationships from which others might have to recover, uh, that's not a relationship. So you have a blessed day.